What do you get when you cross a priest, a cop, and Jason Voorhees with an unspeakable evil that can only use sign language? You get this whacked out demon hand horror flick that is completely on and off the rails. We watched Demonoid and couldn't stop laughing. This surprisingly hilarious movie deserves the moratorium treatment. Cue the music. Yeah, I've got pages, plural. Pages. About halfway through the first page, I said, is this the worst movie we've ever done on the podcast? <laughs> I, and a little bit later, actually halfway down the last page, best movie we've ever done on the podcast? <laughs> That's a real roller coaster of, I didn't know how to feel. I laughed through this movie so much. I, I did too. <laughs> Were they trying to be funny? I don't funny? think so. And I don't think no, so. <laughs> I think they, they really thought that they were making something special. We'll get into it, but there's a real Evil Dead kind of, Evil Dead 2 kind of theme to it. And um, anytime there is like a rogue body part in a movie, <laughs> it's automatically <laughs> hilarious because at just the... <laughs> J just the logistics of it don't mm. add up, you know? Rogue body parts. Which there are a few. The hand with Michael Caine. Mm -hmm. Body parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a movie literally called Body Parts. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't necessarily detach and go on a rampage. No, no. This hand wants to be <sighs> free of its human body. Does host. it? Somewhere in here I have written... This movie has no plot. I mean, there is nothing. I have <laughs> absolutely no idea what any of the characters' uh, motivations are. Nope. If they explain why they were digging there, if it was archaeological reasons. Why they were digging there. It was a national park. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, do you guys have a permit to unearth <laughs> satanic hand worshippers? <laughs> That's it. I really thought the druids were going to yeah. come back into play. Well, yeah, and that like silver, like hand ashtray type thing. They call it the hand coffin. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminded me of like uh, David Duchovny in um, uh, like Zoolander when he has his hand in those like in that like hermetically sealed uh, okay. thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have been thinking about all the body part movies, though. We need to revisit this genre. I had never seen this movie before. I think it's why I chose it. Yeah, I'm based glad. Based on the trailer. Yeah. Which was misleading. The trailer and also the um, the poster yeah. is, like, so cool. I, I really wanted to see that demon come into play. Which you do. He really didn't. No. You know. It's a... Two second scene of what appears to be the devil in like a um, white snake video or something. You know, yes. there's like a lot of smoke, oh, yeah. and you just know that there's a big boob girl that's going to like do the splits or something. Which there are <laughs> boobs in this movie within boobs. the first three minutes, maybe. Oh, easy. You know what? I'm going to kind of have this playing in the background. Okay. Do we need to go ahead and start the film now just so we can saunter into it? I think it would help, yeah. Let's tell our audience what we're watching. We haven't even said the name of the podcast. No. Or the name of the movie we're watching. Or the name of the... We're so excited. We're like chomping at the bit. <laughs> Champing, chomping? Champing, I know. Somebody said that. I want to punch whoever came up with that. Who calls it champing? Roy Scheider. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I already feel like I'm going to giggle through this entire thing. Uh, it's just going to be giggle tracks. Yep. I've got a lot to say, but let's okay. say we're watching 1981 
demonoid. Mm-hmm. The Stuart Whitman vehicle demonoid. <laughs> and not to be confused with the uh, torrenting site that used to be up a long time ago. Ah. I googled demonoid and most of what popped up was just a torrent site. Okay. And I had to say no, the evil hand <laughs> movie. You got to follow with that 1980. Yes, exactly. I was nine years old nine. when this came out. I wish I would have watched it then. Nine times. Nine. And uh, so, welcome to the moratorium. Yeah, let's get this out of the way. Your name is Tim Cornman. It is finally 2021. Oh. Right? And and I say that. Yeah, it's always confusing because we're recording this in the past. Right. Or yeah. recording it now to be released in the future. Whatever. You get what I'm saying. Eventually, we'll be back to the future. So I'm, I'm looking forward to my future self two weeks from now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I wonder, you know, what's going to become of 2021. I just assume it's going to be more of 2020. Yes. A complete disaster. We are just going to be pale, yep. bloated. Yep. Queasy. How many more dwarves are there? <laughs> yeah, Queasy. <sorry. laughs> Hansy. I love that dwarf. Hansy and Pansy. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to the moratorium. I'm Tim Cornman. And with me, as always, is Jason Walker. Me. Hi. That's like two in a row that I actually introduced oh, you. Like. And I've got to say, I love it. I love hearing you say my name. I want to be introduced sometime. I did earlier. I said, what about me? I said, you're Tim Cornman. I oh, just I? declared it. And I missed my cue. Too bad we can't edit this at all. Um, no one in this movie said, "Hey, can you give me a hand with this?" I was really hoping <laughs> that someone that there would be more puns. You know, the whole movie's a pun. I want to know now. So I keep saying druids that these are druids. Um, I mean, they really when you first see them within the first like couple of minutes. I mean, they look like KKK member. You know. And rain slickers. <laughs> yeah. Well, their ritual eventually was going to turn into like a, a Gallagher concert or something. <laughs> I mean, so we're in a cave, right? I'm going to start this movie. I want to watch it. I want to re-verify uh, the things that I think I saw. I think I saw boobies. I know I saw boobies. And we're going to see them again. This chick is... Is the nurse later on. Oh, okay. Another scene in which I laughed my ass off. (laughs) From the moment that they make it to the the doctor's office, I was like, holy shit. This thing is completely (laughs) derailed. What what are they doing? And then it was kind of magic, you know, just really. (laughs) I think if we try to understand the plot, that is a road to madness because there is no plot, really. No, it's not even necessary. No. All we know is that there's a demon hand mm-hmm. in a hand coffin. Yes. In an altar underground. Yes. With druids. With druids. Or. Or KKK. Or KKK. And rain slickers. And um, apparently they are all men with hairy legs and sandals, uh, except for one gorgeous woman that they just brought. <laughs> yeah, I just saw him. one minute and 25 seconds. And her she has a well, wardrobe malfunction. Boobies. All the KKK uniforms have that tearaway front. Yeah, it's like a crepe paper or something. So this is this is a hand based movie. You're going to see a lot of, you know, little trenches dug so that some guy mm-hmm. can, you know, wear a black uh, <laughs> sweater and be the hand, you know. And even that, even that practical stuff that you would like do at like a kid's birthday party or something, uh-huh. they managed to completely fuck up. It looks so <laughs> fake. I want to get this out of the way because I'll probably forget it. But when music starts playing the kind of like string music, the... the um, Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of like panic music. I was like, man, where do I know that from? And it's it has the same soundtrack as The Incredible Melting Man. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. The exact same. I mean, you know, even like the tension hooks and all that stuff. So I looked up the special effects, you know, because uh, like, oh, gosh, my brain. Um, Ken Horn 
He was in the makeup department of Battle Beyond the Stars. Yes, and he also he also I think made the original. Uh, he came up with the Boogan, the Boogan. He, oh, he created those little that's creatures. Badass. So that I completely by chance saw his name. Well, he also did the uh, the special effects for Tourist Trap. Yes, right. They did like the masks and stuff. Hills Have Eyes, Swamp Thing. Mm-hmm. Boy, that movie just keeps on popping up. Conan the Barbarian, uh, Hills Have Eyes, Part 2, Halloween 4. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The least said about that, the better. Let's tell the audience though, what actually happens in the first five minutes okay. is uh, the this woman, the woman druid, mm-hmm. finds the hand. In a in the hand coffin at a, a makeshift altar? Question mark. Yes, it's just next to a fire, keeping it warm. Also, she looks like she came from like a discotheque. You know what I mean? Like her hair. <laughs> nothing about her matches. I mean, I assume that 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 all is supposed to happen in a a you know hundreds of years ago or something. But yeah, a way earlier time. But yeah, we're not we're not getting any hints on that. I definitely could be wrong. Like uh, it, I guess those uh, KKK robes are timeless. <laughs> they have a slimming effect, is what the deal is. <laughs> I read uh, it's in some of the trivia on De- Demonoid now that mm-hmm. that Alfredo Zacharias, the uh, director, mm, you're making me hungry. Mm, yes, sounds delicious. Uh, that he had in mind to sell this to Roger Corman or to get Roger Corman's company to distribute it. Mm -hmm. And he decided to distribute it himself. But I think if they would have, uh, if they would have had one of those screenings of this film for Roger Corman, yeah, with of course, the laughter, there would have been laughter throughout <laughs> the film. There had to have been. He would have had to fist fight everyone in the in the <laughs> movie house. You just see his bloody knuckles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who's next? You're gonna have to take four frames off of the leader and the footer on this one. <laughs> Man, about halfway through this movie is when it like really takes off. Up until then, it is a little boring. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where I have gone. How would I have gotten to Chinatown? Oh, because Roy right. Jensen is yes the the main guy. I mean, he's one of the first actors that you see. He's basically like um, he kind of looks like Alan Hale Jr. a little bit, like yeah. the skipper from Gilligan's Island, yeah. but like seventies. You know. Anyway, he was he was in Chinatown. There's another connection, but anyway, he's the he's the guy that holds Jack Nicholson while Roman Polanski slices his nose, and he he is very goonish. Yeah, he is a goon, especially when he drinks that oh, bottle of whatever and fucking just throws himself around the apartment. I really think, you know, that he had one good day on the set, and the yeah. rest of the time he was just totally drunk off his ass. And yeah. I think that they were like, oh, well, we'll just make the best out of this shot. Let's watch him just stumble around, because I don't think that was acting. No, we'll <laughs> we'll make that part of the plot that he's just a degenerate drinker. Uh, Stuart Whitman also. Oh, uh, yeah. Seems to be. I swear he, when he got in the car to drive off, he was just like, "All right, where's the pedal?" Yeah, they have a bunch of uh, things. Yep. You know those like Jeep things. Love them. One's a pink one. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the car chase later on is like, let's get in the biggest cars <laughs> that we possibly can and just terrorize this <laughs> city block in Mexico or wherever. I keep saying Mexico. I assume that this thing is uh, all shot in Mexico, right? Also, who is Dr. Julian Rivkin? I don't know who that is. That's, that is the doctor. I mean, there's only one doctor. Oh, 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 okay. And he's making out with the nurse. Right, right, right. <laughs> he is like blatantly <laughs> make it out with her when they burst <laughs> in. <laughs> they knock on the door and he's basically like <laughs> just like motorboating her boobs. You're like, what? I'm a doctor. <laughs> His name is uh Narcoso Buskets. Yes. Which I love those with a bit of like uh, kind of a sharp cheddar cheese, you know? And, uh <laughs> or some brie. Is it no, narc, 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 narc
It's Spanish for chicken and a biscuit, okay. I think. All right. There's also yummy mummies later. Oh, yes. There's, there's a lot of like food in this. I would love to have a yummy mummy, mm-hmm. in which all the kids were holding, trying to sell them the same thing. It was like, yeah, get- kid, if I eat all those, I'm going to be a diabetic. <laughs> they look like they basically just pressed um, those disgusting um, peanuts, those orange peanuts, Ooh. those like fluffy, Ooh. they just made them into like the Virgin Mary or something. Oh. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> it's a all- Virgin Mary made out of circus peanuts. That's a I great- do not like that. So we're basically into uh, this old mine that they said that they've been trying to mine this for 300 years, I believe. Okay. Because I I missed every bit of why our main characters are interested in that thing. Uh, Well, we've totally just blown this beginning off. So I'm (laughs) Well, because I don't think the filmmakers cared very much. Well, the druid girl who got the hand, the hand became part of her. She tried to kill the other druids. They ripped her shirt open, chained her to the wall, and cut off her hand. The hand then subsequently starts crawling through the dirt as one of the other druids stabs it and puts it back in the hand coffin. That's our beginning. That's it. That's what you've got so far. So if it seems like we're not giving you an... I mean... If whoever's listening to this, just watch this movie. It's on Amazon. I, th- I want to say it's on YouTube also. Yes, yes it is. Uh, but to really understand the insanity, you have to uh, you have to watch along. It, it is a must-see. I will be yeah. recommending this for every 12-year-old. Oh, for sure. But while she has the hand on her, she has uh, abnormally... Superhuman large, strength. Yeah, superhuman strength, where she mm-hmm. chokes a guy out by raising him up in the air and, and yeah. crushing his throat. Also, the people that are attacking her are kind of helping her like choke them and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that fight scene when they come in and just start oh my God. rumbling with her is hysterical. Yeah. Everybody is overacting in this film. And Samantha oh, Egger sure. totally hams it up later. Oh, God. Yes. A, a lot of like the... Uh, you know, trying to move the plot forward is the characters just being really stupid and clumsy. Yeah. You know, I mean, they never would have found that hidden cave if he hadn't just like <laughs> sort of <laughs> fallen down in some. It's not even quicksand. It's just no, it's just sand. And he just flops around in it. He's just like, oh, yeah. oh, I'm trapped. And like, no, no, yeah. you're not. No, you're drunk and... (laughs) Again. I wrote not so quick sand because it literally is just a pile of sand. Samantha Eggert is... I think all of this uh, exposition takes place of her sent out looking at the landscape of Mexico with Pepe, who is wearing a hard hat the entire fucking movie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He wears a hard hat into church. (laughs) I was like, man, that guy's dedicated to safety. Maybe he had a bunch of OSHA recordables or something the year before. You and can't like, be too I'm safe just, in this film. I'm just leaving this thing on. It's been zero days since we got attacked by a hand. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to the cave where she wants to find her husband who's digging in this this mine. Yeah. So she puts on a, a hard hat, but she's got fucking stilettos on as she's yeah. walking into this. Those are not steel-toed. No. They're open to They're the opposite. It does a close-up shot so you can actually see it, but she stands on the, uh, the rail system. Yeah. It kind of looks like Temple of Doom a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, but she's walking on that rail, and I'm like, man, that's pretty talented. That's, yeah, and dangerous. So she goes and finds him. They do a little kind of walk and talk, and then he just falls into quicksand. She starts walking through, but she accidentally creates a cave in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they find a skeleton who is missing its left hand. Oh, my God. And it's got kind of like a Sonny Bono kind of type of wig on. <laughs> that thing just flops down right on top of her. Yeah. That I think that was the first time I was like, okay, hold up. This is going to be... Pretty good. The skeleton has this bag of silver or whatever. A Pepe says, look, look, look what he had, you know. I'm sorry. I, I got to stop doing that accent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that really is what, 
That's kind of what he sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So they find the silver or whatever, and they're talking about how, okay, this mine's been closed for 300 years and going, you know, he knew that this was going to strike it rich. And there's a little scene where they're, they're in a museum and they're looking uh-huh. at all these mummies. Yeah. It looks like the, um, it looks like that exhibit that was, um, oh, I can't remember what the name of it was. Anyway. Yeah. There's a bunch of dead people. Now, are we to assume that they're there because maybe they just delivered the skeleton that they just found in this mine? Maybe. Like, hey, we brought you something. <laughs> yeah, you want, I'll give you, uh, you give me 50 bucks, you can have all four of these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is jumping ahead in the film, but really there's nothing that's happening before this moment. No. There's just a lot of walking and talking and, yeah. and I guess his mining crew but basically just gone on strike saying we are not going into this mine because there's a language barrier and <laughs> right. And Pepe yeah, exactly. is not standing up for any of it. <laughs> no, no, no. So he and his wife decide to go into the mine as deep as they can. They're traversing this 50 degree angle. Yeah. Like I said, it looks like an explorable cave. She changed her shoes. Roy Jensen picks up a rock and throws it down to show her how long and deep this this trail is through this yeah. cave. That is the most irresponsible thing ever. Yeah, you are going exactly. to cause so many cave-ins. Sure. Asking for trouble. Yeah. Well, he's drunk. I mean... Yeah. He doesn't. <laughs> and in fact, when they're walking along, somebody's up there and you can kind of see that there's somebody down there throwing fake rocks at them. These right. <laughs> yes. Like styrofoam rocks. Mm-hmm. I've always wanted to do that. Like just get, get a bunch of like styrofoam rocks and just have them fall on me. <laughs> but this is horribly, horribly dangerous. Yeah. They're not smart. They're not safety conscious. Mm-mm. Conscious. Conscience. Edit. Those other two out, but <laughs> uh, but having a good time, you know. Oh yeah, well, he's like, "Hey, wife, come help me. We're going to explore yeah. the depths of this cave." And <laughs> yeah, this is their vacation. I thought about the Boogans when they came out into the opening <laughs> of that cave. Uh huh. It reminded me of the Boogans. Yeah, they said it must be a hundreds of years old, but it's like a torture chamber. Yeah. It looks like when they discover like Pazuzu and stuff like that. Yeah. That what I <sighs> Sorry, he just fell into the sand. I know. And dude. he's just wallowing around on the sand. He's they're like uh, the effect was supposed to him him falling <laughs> through this thing and truthfully he's just agitating it himself. He's like yeah, gotta, exactly. He sticks his leg down in there. He's like I got to kick this door open. <laughs> right. Oh, now it's working. Yeah. And he just falls through the dirt and comes out into this chamber. You can faintly hear him say, we, yeah. when he goes down. <laughs> I said, we plenty of times in this movie. Oh, yeah. When the hand jumps on its own. <laughs> to, to... When they get to that doctor's office and the cop is involved. <laughs> from then on, it is wild. Bonkers. Absolutely wild. Bonkers when the cop has his his own hand on this metal tray like he's serving it for dessert. Oh. <laughs> Just, oh <my> God. <laughs> exactly. You guys have room for dessert mm-hmm. or can I offer you a hand? This is handmade. <laughs> oh. Also, <laughs> this is gonna this is a very punny movie. She climbs down and visit and joins him in this dis dungeon area it's a satanic there's a whole area that looks like a satanic yeah worshiping site yeah and he immediately lights a fire and i'm like dude dude uh yeah she uh, says what is that and he's like it's oil it's give oil. me a give me a light mm-hmm. like hey <laughs> maybe we shouldn't just be having open flames willy-nilly in a cave there's actually uh one of those weird snake-like knives stuck yes. into the altar yes there's a freaking uh, podium back there with with a book open up. The the only thing they take is the hand coffin. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's there there a- are relics, priceless relics. They were already yes. at the museum. This belongs in a museum. 
Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, again, I think that all gets explained away by them just being monumentally stupid people. <laughs> There's a demon statue missing its left hand. And, okay, well, we've seen enough. Mm. I got my hand coffin and yeah. they just leave. Yeah. So we see flashes throughout the film of yes. the, the demon, kind of like a Pazuzu type. Lit from behind, and it's like a it's like Satan holding a pretty badass sword up. Yeah, it does. It looks very much like a uh, like a metal album cover from yeah. the eighties. I'd buy it. I'd buy it too. I wonder if there's a band called Demonoid. <laughs> there has to be. When they get back to their little house, or what? Well, unclear if that's their house or if they're just kind of renting that or, or squatters. Or whatever. <laughs> squatters. Uh. She goes to bed and he stays up and um I was actually watching it this time. There's only like a quarter of that bottle gone. There must have been another bottle. There had to be many bottles. Um, because he is like wasted, stumbling, can't walk, drunk. Well, they started drinking champagne to begin with. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. Mistake. Never mix champagne and tequila together. Mm, those are bad demon times there. Mm-hmm. So he's drunk, stumbling around, mm -hmm. decides to open up the hand coffin, finally. But it's not yeah. like this This thing looks like it's made out of aluminum. Yes, it's not very sturdy. It has a small little clasp on the side. Yeah. You've waited till now to open it? Yeah. Weren't you curious? And this is probably some of the worst effects in the entire movie. It's when they do the stop motion of yeah. this, the, the the hand coffin's filled with just ashes. Right. Well, I mean, hands don't, I mean, in that type of container, they would have needed, like, you know, Tupperware or something <laughs> to seal in the freshness. But it looks like he, he dumped it out onto, like, his Coke tray. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, he's going to do a couple of lines of it. <laughs> I'm just going to do a couple of lines of the hand demon here. That would actually explain why he's uh, acting like he is. So he dumps out the ashes, crawls into bed with her, and the ashes reform into the demon's hand. Flops into bed with her. Man, he is not acting. He is <laughs> drunk <laughs> off his ass. <laughs> exactly. But are they in that hotel? Is that what it was? The Hotel de la Menos? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yes, it's just a little hotel room. But this hand coming back to life and crawling off, I... I asked my wife, since I'm in a, a a position here to continue to sink money into projects that do not make any kind of return. Uh-huh. <laughs> Zero profit. I want to buy the rights to this movie mm -hmm. and do a voiceover for the hand. Oh, yeah. Because this hand is the best actor in the movie. That is very true. <laughs> it's like... I guess you're wondering how, like, it stops, you know, <laughs> while the hand's moving. Here. It's like, yeah, you're probably wondering how I got here, you know. <laughs> that would be awesome. What would what would be your take on the hand voice? I kind of make it, like, kind of Chicago a little bit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know. I like Norm from, uh, or not Norm, but um, the other guy. Right. <laughs> from Cheers. Cliff. Cliff. I'd give it Cliff's voice. He's good. He does a uh, Toy Story and yep. all those. <laughs> he would be good. You're probably wondering how I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the bears. <laughs> so she's laying in bed and, and this demon hand starts crawling up on her bed and caressing her leg. Mm -hmm. Which and are kind of hairy. Did you notice that she has kind of like hairy legs? I wasn't going to say anything. It's the pandemic now. So everybody has hairy legs. I'm not shaming her at all, but I just, I thought it was. But, you know, she's a redhead, so she kind of has, like, fine, like, blonde hair. A little fur. Yeah, she's covered in fur. Immediately when she wakes up and looks down, her bedside lamp comes on. 
yeah, right? <laughs> like it pulled the little chain and <laughs> or like clicked that switch on the power cord. Okay, so is this hand being controlled by the demon or does this hand right. have its own own mind? Well, it doesn't have eyes, right. so the light coming on <laughs> would not help it at all, I wouldn't think. And it doesn't have any sense of smell, or how mm-hmm. does it know where anybody is? <laughs> I think the explanation for all of that is just Satan. Mm-hmm. It's all I can come up with. So he wrestles the hand off of her. You're not going to touch her. She's my wench. Exactly. He wrestles with the hand in which it kind of takes him down as it's, you know. Yeah, he's basically moshing with it. Then they immediately like, oh, we must, it must have been a dream. It must have been tequila <laughs> nightmares. <laughs> it, it must, <laughs> I knew not to mix that Coke, champagne, and white tequila. Yeah. I don't, give me a tequila brand. What's a good tequila brand? Um, Not Jose Cuervo. We'll just call it not Jose Cuervo. (laughs) So after that scene, it's kind of a like smash cut to him at the casino, right? Well, she. I had to rewind it because I was like, what? How? How is. And he's got like a beard now, like a couple of weeks have passed. I think that's what they had to play off is that it's been a while since he disappeared. A while? I guess the demon is controlling him. Mm-hmm. All right, so he left. He abandoned her that night. She found oh. him the next day at the mine, and Pepe says that Pepe, <laughs> Pepe, Pepe, nope, Pepe, <laughs> Pepe, just Pepe. He uh, explains that yes, yes, uh, your husband, what's his name, Mark, mm-hmm. he's down in the cave and he's forced all the men down there. I, which makes me wonder, all of these guys were being paid. They already were afraid to go. Why would they return to work? Okay, I've kind of forgot about that. Probably because that scene is only like five minutes long. But is he like setting charges or something yes. in there to in order to blow it up? He's forced the men down into the cave. And then within moments of her showing up, Pepe's just been hanging out. Okay, so so you've, you're meant to think that he really is like off the rails, like, doing weird shit. Oh, yeah. Um, But then it's undercut by him going to the casino because he seems uh, drunk and belligerent, but pretty normal. The demons made me do it. But when he sets the charge and blows everything, the cave, up. and his action jump into that thing and driving off. Oh, my off, God. Very Shatner-esque. <laughs> but, he, yeah, he shows up at the Sands playing... Yeah. <laughs> Freaking craps with his demon hand. Yeah, I just figured out who he looks like. He looks like Slim Pickens a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Slightly more sober Slim Pickens. Yeah. That's a lot of S's. Slightly sober Slim Slickens. <laughs> so, what if his name was Slim Slickens? <laughs> Ew, never mind. He's at the craps table throwing with his left hand, throwing with his demon hand. And uh-huh. I guess out of nowhere, there's Ted White. Yes. This is Haji with him. Right, yes. Looking very busty and very beautiful. Basically, they just find him and say, oh, there's an easy mark. Let's take this guy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. And that kind of confused me, too, a little bit. I was like, who the fuck are these people? But then I think they're just uh, lining up some hand fodder, you know, Mm -hmm. just some people to get attacked by the hand. But I think Ted White's been here for a while or what. He starts betting... But he walks up to another woman at the table. Yeah, and kind of grabs her face a little bit. Yeah, just kind of sneaks his hand around her cheek and just like, hey, lady. Yeah, get lost. (laughs) He doesn't know her. I don't know. I don't know either. He seems kind of like a pimp a little bit, or he's just got this kind of like operation going. So Ted White, actually, he's from Texas, but he played football for the University of Oklahoma. Wow, really? Yeah. Yeah. He was a stunt double for Clark Gable, John Wayne, and Fess Parker. I don't know who Fess Parker is. He's like an old cowboy dude. He was an old yeller. Okay. He played the dog. Yeah. He disliked being involved with Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Hmm. He turned down the opportunity to go back for part five and for part six. Hmm. And he, I I think I was reading that, yeah, now he wishes he hadn't because. Yeah, I would think that would be like what you're going. I mean. Yeah. That's a, that's a prime role right there. Well, considering that 
his picture on IMDb is him as Jason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. This is interesting. He refused to talk to the other actors on the set of Friday the 13th, the final chapter, because mm-hmm. he thought it would diminish their fear of Jason. Yeah. I think a lot of those dudes do that. Get really into character. Yes. Very method. Yes. If you think about it, though, can you just see him wearing the mask, holding oh a machete, God, just staring at the other cast members? <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs> at the craft service table. <laughs> yeah. He probably really got into that. Mm-hmm. But he's still wearing, like, bell bottoms and, like, a tweed <laughs> jacket. He just has the mask on. So, good stuff. Yep. Thank you, Ted, yes. for all your hard work. I'm sure he's passed away by now. Nope. Are you kidding me? He is still with us. He was born in 1926, so he's uh, he's up Jesus. there. He is 94. Wow. Well, just looking at him, he looks like he survived on a strict diet of scotch and cigarettes. Yep. But I could be wrong. Filterless. Filterless, of course. I figured that that was implied. <laughs> Back to the movie now. She, I'm sorry, Samantha, Samantha Egger, Egger is going to find her husband who has disappeared from Mexico and she tracks him minute. down to Vegas. I did not think about us like switching locations. They're in Vegas uh, at the Sands. If you look in the background there, okay, Wayne yeah, Newton right. is at the Sands. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I think Paul Schaefer is on one of the uh, <laughs> one of the billboards too. On the taxi is uh, Mac Davis. Yeah, cool. uh, he just died recently. Mac Davis died recently. That was a uh, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. That's it. That was my pop's favorite song. Was sing that all the time. Really? I do not. I'm not familiar with no? that. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Okay. I, I can't wait to song. look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. I just assume oh. he sounds like that in, in his old age before he died. Yes. He was singing this on his deathbed. I think we can assume that. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> so, but no, I want to know how she tracked him down to Vegas. She doesn't have Pepe anymore mm-hmm. to keep track of everybody. No, but she's got a newspaper of his disappearance and basically just showing this to to everybody. That's a that's a really confusing <laughs> plot point. Oh, okay. I, on that newspaper, it says Mark Davis is a big Vegas winner. That's what it says. Okay. I, I say Mac Davis. What you said Mac Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Baines or Mark Rain, whatever the fuck his name is. <laughs> I, you're better than I, I didn't even, <laughs> oh, it, his name is Mark, okay. Yes. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so for whatever re- um, sloppy writing or filmmaking, I guess, mm. could explain that, but yeah. But he's he's fallen prey to <laughs> to uh, Ted White and... Um, Haji. Uh, yeah, Haji yeah. from Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Wait, was she in that? Yes. Okay, so they've got him in a weird, like, shed or something. It kind of looks like the work shed in Evil Dead. So she lures him back to their car, like she wants Mm -hmm. to leave with him. And Ted White just smacks him. Yeah, like Black Jacks him on the back of the head. And shoves him in the back of the car. And that's where we see Dave Barry uh, is at (laughs) the Sands. (laughs) Yes. Um, I think that's where you see Paul Schaefer, too. (laughs) It also has the Jive Sisters. I... Would love to listen to the Jive Sisters. So they kidnap him and drive him off into the desert. Which is so easy to do. Like, he has probably been kidnapped like 20 times. And this looks like a a kidnap shack that they just have out here in the... Yeah, you're right. They've done this many times before. I think this is amazing because Ted White grabs... Roy Jensen out of the backseat of the car, just hefts him over his shoulder and carries him into the shack. Like a bag of dog food or something. Yeah. Yeah. And he really does that. Yes. And he's talking, he's acting and talking during the scene, not grunting and panting. No, he's. eh, eh. Wow. Just, he's probably had plenty of practice at this. He's, that's his primary, like, character trait in all of his movies is that he's just can carry people. Well, he's carrying the scene, I'll tell you that. Yeah, he is. 
Well, and Haji's doing a lot of the heavy lifting with uh, sweater puppies. Um, But yeah, so they tie him up to a little rickety thing, which he's not fighting at all. He's like kind of into it, I think. Well, I mean, what would you do if you were, uh, you know. Make the best of it. Yeah. I mean, you you are possessed by a hand demon. Right. Just fucking roll with it. (laughs) Can we call the hand handy? Just like. It's like. (laughs) That hand went on to become the um, hamburger helper. That's what's in the the mitten or the uh, <laughs> the oven mitt, the oven glove. <laughs> Little known facts. Little known facts. I mean, that's why you listen to this, right? But yeah, so they're oddly enough wanting to cut his hands off, which has mm-hmm. nothing to do with anything else. But he wants to know why he's so lucky, because I guess he's just been. He's on a roll. Uh, right. There is a scene right before we cut to, you know, present day or whatever, where he looks at his hand and there's like a negative image kind of mm-hmm. and like a like a 70s like guitar, you know, note being played in the background. But that's weird because it's helping him out when everybody else that it encounters, it just immediately like wants to kill him. Mm-hmm. The motivation of the hand is real hard to like nail down because it's all over the place. This is the first real laughable part in the film. There's a plenty of laughable parts. Oh, when Stuart Whitman is involved oh. uh, from that moment on. It's hilarity. Yeah. Does he snap Ted White's neck with his demon hand? I have no idea because that is the lamest fight. At, he kind of like roughs him up with his uh, his own jacket. <laughs> and Ted White's just like, ah! It's like, well, he wasn't even strangling you or anything. <laughs> you you basically helped him beat you up. Him killing Haji. Oh, my God. Is the best death Just crushes ever. her just face <laughs> like... And you can tell how everybody seems like they're right-handed, so they're trying to control their left hand to do yes. odd, yes. specific things. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. The Foley artist for that basically just, like, crumpled up a bunch of saltines in one of those sleeves, you know? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> but her, the look on her face as she yeah. slowly dies and almost regains her composure and then slides back down the wall. That was pretty Man. good. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Nobody wears a bra. Which Jensen really needs one. Oh, yeah. He's got some heavy hangers. He realizes the demon hand is taking over his life, so he tries to chop it off. Right. So he grabs a machete and mm-hmm. puts his hand down and tries to <laughs> chop it off, in which the hand then stops him by grabbing his other hand. He, he catches his own hand. That was the first laugh for me. I was like, <laughs> What? <laughs> His acting during that was like, it's like, that's the take that we're going to keep is that like horrible, but funny. He's trying to cut off the hand, but then falls down the ground and finds a gas can, pours gas all over him. Right. Now that's the hand doing that. You're right. It was the left hand. First base. (laughs) Wait, (laughs) I don't think I understand that joke. Yeah. It gets real Evil Dead right there, where he's like kind of sli- like moshing around and kind of still looking like he's just on a bender. Yes, yes. the The actor. Yeah, you're right. The left hand grabs the freaking lantern, throws it down, sets himself on fire. Yes. Then jumps out the window and the shed explodes. By the way, like I don't know what they had in there, but it does blow up, dude. I read this in the trivia. Okay. Back it up just a hair at 30.09. Okay. When he falls to the ground, he's on fire and his left hand kind of goes into the dirt like to Uh protect itself. Right. If you look in the shed behind him while the flames are rolling, you can see one of the extras crawling out the back window. (laughs) You, You totally see plumbers crack. Oh, no. As the guy's going out the back window. Well, you're going to get that. I wonder if he was not like not meant to be in that shed and they just blew up an extra. <laughs> we just blew up the third <laughs> stunt man. The, what are we going to do? The Foley guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Samantha's just going around to the police to find out if they knew something about her husband who just committed suicide in the desert. 
Yes. So she was at the same casino and he managed to get kidnapped before she saw him, right? Yes. Okay. I buy every bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> also a part of the plot that just like a lot of other things goes absolutely nowhere. Mm-hmm. But it gives you a couple of kills for the hand. And I also like that, that the, the hand was like kind of cunning, you know, that it <laughs> it planned to blow him up and then bury itself. I, I actually kind of like that part. We finally get to introduce the priest, Stuart Whitman. How does she meet him? And it's because she goes to the police station to find out why her husband was the one that was killed in this shack fire <laughs> in the middle of. <laughs> and she believes it's him, but there's like... Yeah, she knows it's him. Yeah, she actually gets pissed off that they're questioning her. She knows it's yeah. him. But the body has been released to Stuart Whitman. Well, yeah, he's the... He, well, I don't know if that's how that works, but it is buried in his... There is a body. Yeah, it looks like a... Well, you'll, I guess, in a moment... It during one of the most incoherent special effects things I, I have ever seen. The way they edited that together, I was like, now, wait a minute, what just happened? It. I think this is where the comedy really comes in. She wants to exhume her husband's body, basically, and she's got to yes. talk to Sir Whitman in order to do it. But he is the priest of this like parish that, or of this uh, church that's on the cemetery grounds, maybe? I, I guess so. I don't know. I don't even know if that's how that works. But uh, he, Stuart Whitman is Irish, you know, from Irish descent. He's lived in Ireland, I read on his thing. Um, but the accent that he is kind of off and on, it, it comes and goes without, you know what I mean? <laughs> so he takes her out to the grave. Of where this body was buried. Right. The body, we get to see a small scene of this ninja freaking explosion body just <laughs> exploding out of the ground. Yeah. While they're walking. So. Yes. It's just cut together very confusingly because. It, I think there's another order for those scenes to be working in where that made sense. So while they're walking, it looks to be like midnight, which is oh, yes. when you need to do a, you know, all body exhumations. Yeah. Ex ex exhumations. Exhumations. I would assume. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, but she immediately, she's like, this, this grave was, nobody dug up this grave. It was she, definitely happened from the inside out. She knows a lot of things implicitly that like, you're like, well, we don't know that. We've seen all the same things you have. <laughs> but yeah, dude, they buried a stuntman crouched down mm -hmm. like he's under the floor of like a Britney Spears uh, concert or something. And they have a springboard mm -hmm. <laughs> that he is just they had to have used air, you know, like a, a, there's oh, no yeah. way a person can move like that. But, like, bursts out of that thing in slow motion. It looks like a scene from uh, Six Million Dollar Man with all the, like, yeah. slow-mo and stuff. Do the sound for me. -na 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 -na. <laughs> That's all it is. -na 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 -na. I don't know how they... I guess they did it with, like, a synthesizer. Anyway. There's, like, a two-second scene after they've called the cops yeah. of the, the burnt corpse staggering about just... Outside the grave. Also, seconds from the time that Stuart Whitman and, and Samantha Egger walk off. Yes. Like, he was he crouched <laughs> down behind a, a headstone or something? Yep, that's it. Just hanging out here. And she knows for sure. She's like, no, no. A body exploded out of this grave. <laughs> yes. And Stuart Whitman's like, eh, okay. Right, we'll, get the, we'll get the cops involved. Yeah. So when our officer shows up to the scene... I thought it was O.J. Simpson for a second, <laughs> which would have made this movie even better. He actually is one of the better actors in the uh, movie. Lou Sanders. Lou Saunders. Lou Saunders. He was a job interviewer guy in Cocktail. I should have known that. Uh, um. <laughs> obviously. Job interviewer. He was a... Uh, 
two episodes of Quincy. Yeah. Officer Gene Fritz and Chips. Yes. He looks familiar. Man, I used to love Quincy. He was in a few episodes of uh, Matt Houston. Yeah, saw that. Father Downing Mysteries. He played cop. Jake and the Fat Man. He played cop number two. Hardcastle and McCormick. Uh, his name is Undercover McCormick, which if that's your first <laughs> name, that's a poor first name if you're going to be. <laughs> He's that's like, beautiful. yeah, I know. <laughs> My mom thought it would be funny. And I became a cop and it's not funny anymore. Uh, finder of Lost Loves. Uh, he played a police officer. Stingray, he played Smitty. He was really miscast in that. I'm sure they had a cop like, in there. you sure you don't want me to be a cop? <laughs> That's pretty much my thing. I'm like, no, you're going to be Smitty. Stand over there by the <laughs> Corvette and shut up. Uh, murder, she wrote. Uh, yep. Plain clothes policeman. And the episode, he played a policeman in the episode of uh, Proof in the Pudding. You, I'm sure you remember that one. Nope. Have you ever found any proof in pudding? Nope. I don't nope. like pudding. You don't like pudding? I could probably count on both of my hands how many times I've had pudding in my life. You know, it's, it's pronounced pudding. Ew, that's even worse. <laughs> Watching this gross 70s movie and you say pudding. Ugh. Also, like, everybody's walking around... I mean, it's like the dead of night and all this crazy shit's happening, but he, what did he do? Did he get out of his car, walk around, and then when he comes back, the, the body's there? Yes. Well, the the burnt body decided it needed, this is this movie is just like The Hidden, okay? It is a little bit, yes. This is just an alien jumping from body to body. Yeah, That's where, yeah you're right. Uh, freaking Ted White was in The Hidden. Okay, yes, that's what I, I knew there was some link to the hidden from this, but the burnt pepperoni man he looks like Dr. Fibes a little bit. Very much so. Very good. This does not look anything like Jensen. No. <laughs> it's a, he's a way thinner guy. You know what he looks like? He kind of looks like um you know like Dr. Goodbody, the like <laughs> like the Jewish guy that was showed you like you know, do you remember that guy at all? He was on TV when I was a kid. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yes. So this burnt up charcoal of a man trying to get rid of his demon hand by slamming it in the cop door. Yep. Yep. G can you chop off a man's hand like that? I don't know. I saw um, in Daredevil, the TV show, the guy from Full Metal Jacket, um, Vincent D'Onofrio. Mm -hmm. He's playing a kingpin and he like decapitates a dude by slamming his head into his like SUV door. That's awesome. It's pretty sweet. I was like, I don't think I've ever seen anyone killed like that before. <laughs> There's your bingo card. That's it, guys. Write it down. Head decapitation by car door or dehandestration from what do you call it when you ch there's probably a I term. I think you just said it. Dehandestration. <laughs> <laughs> so the the hand is crawling around on the driver's seat of the cop car yeah. and reaches up to honk the horn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this hand is a real like it's a prankster. Yeah, he's a prankster. <laughs> he's like a George Clooney or something. Shitting in the in the cat box or whatever. You ever heard that story? No. Oh I god. Don't. I'm not going to repeat oh, it, but I'll look it up. I'll give you some more details next week. He lived with that like annoying guy from, um, oh, fuck, what's the name of that show with uh, Paul Reiser and, um, <laughs> man, I'm blowing it. <laughs> oh, we're blowing it. I got to focus. Yes. This is where I really, I think I laughed out loud when the police officer picks up Pepperoni Boy uh -huh. and just rolls him down the <laughs> hill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, man, he's done this before. I imagine so. Yeah. Just drops him and rolls him down the hill, watches him for a second. Yeah, like, man, he got some good, he had a lot of momentum. And in the meantime, so uh, Samantha Eggert and Stuart Whitman start running out because they heard a gunshot. I didn't get the gunshot bit. I didn't either. And they they said that later that they heard a gunshot and he just tore off. Or he's like, "Did you shoot a gun?" He's like, "Yeah, that was me." 
Yeah. Like this is a church. Yeah. He's like, uh, I had another call to go to <laughs> nothing to see here. Okay. So they're basically just saying that, uh, <laughs> they're basically just saying uh dismember is what is, you know, the term, the correct term. You're oh, okay. Not dis d hand unhandration. Unhand her. <laughs> it's replantation uh, every time. No, that's just possession. Wow. Never mind. We're really getting into it. <laughs> so, but Stuart Whitman has, he he knows this cop. Yes. He's boxed with him before or something. He goes to the same gym. Yeah. That's where I guess Stuart Whitman fancies himself as a boxer as well. He is a boxer. This is a scene right? that really goes nowhere. No, it doesn't. But it let him, it was like, well, what can you, you know, he's like, well, I know how to box. He was like a, uh, he was a boxer in the army or the Navy or something. I read oh, that earlier. Oh, yep. Yeah, I think you're right. And he said he won like 32 matches or something. Really? But that was probably about, I don't know, 25 years ago from when this happens, maybe longer. Yeah. I worry about Stuart Whitman. In this movie. Anyway, back to the movie, Demonoid. Oh, no, Remember no, the no, movie, no, Demonoid, no, that we're watching? No. It's about a hand. It's called Demonoid. It's about a hand. Is the hand controlled by Satan? Or this demon. We need to know the name of this demon. Can we call it Kalamudre? <laughs> yes. <laughs> call it whatever. Is that a Gargoyles <laughs> reference? Yes. Yes, it was. Awesome. So Stuart Whitman going after this guy, this police officer in the ring, and he's really giving it all. Yeah. But he's taken down by like three jabs. <laughs> in slow <laughs> motion that don't even come close to being in contact with his face. <laughs> they shot it from over kind of his shoulder, mm. and he's just like, goo -goo, goo -goo, and it's like not even, anyway. But this has to be a satanic demon because when it sees... The necklace around right. It's Stuart like a vampire Whitman's neck. Hand. His cross. Yeah, yeah. It's like a vampire hand. He's like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. Thanks for letting me rope a dope you for five minutes. Cut to him driving around being a cop, and he arrests Samantha Egger. Yes. He's being controlled by the hand now. This demon hand made me be a dick cop. <laughs> yeah, the demon hand would have to have like modern day like Google Maps or something to figure out all the places it needed to be. Like, why mm. did he just roll up and get her? I mean, anyway. I don't know. Let's hear from the hand. Yeah. What's the hand got to hey. say? <laughs> <laughs> what if you look down and it had like the little, um, what's that guy called? You know, you kind of like put lipstick on your thumb and your finger and... <laughs> right. Oh, there's a guy that did that. I can't think of his name. Okay. Around about the 45 minute mark, shit starts getting crazy because he takes the cop who actually here in this next scene, he was like delivering his lines with at least some, you know, conviction. A lot better than what everybody else is doing. But anyway, um, he goes to the doctor who is who again? What is his... uh? It is Julian Rifkin, yeah. Narciso Biscuits. 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 I call him Dr. Biscuits. Narc, Narc Biscuits. Anyway, his name's Dr. Biscuits from now on, but uh, <laughs> he is he is basically motor... This is the wildest, like, doctor's office ever, because there's basically, like, a 70s apartment, and that's the, like, waiting room, mm -hmm. and he is basically molesting his big titted nurse easily he's in a doctor's jacket it's basically like the very beginning of a porn oh yeah he looks kind of like the mexican version of wario he kind of looks like wario <laughs> yeah, yeah i get that okay we get some new information in this scene because the cop says He's basically telling Samantha Egger that the hand is meant for you. You're you're the one that yes. it wants. She's the rightful owner Which of this hand. I don't even begin to know how that makes sense. No. So this guy, this like Wario, has basically a soldering iron. That's what I'm looking at. It, mm. It's it's a tiny little it's like what you would use to uh solder like a a, a tiny like circuit board. This is a bovie pen. Okay. 
And we use it when we're doing like uh, pacemakers and stuff we, to cauterize. Uh huh. Basically, it's a cautery pin. Gotcha. But it doesn't cut, does it? Uh, it cuts through flesh. Can it cut through bone? Right. I think it would take a lot more than that. You'd use more like conventional means to uh, like a mm. giant pair of scissors or something. And which he says he doesn't want any anesthesia. No, he wants to do it stone cold sober. He's got a gun in his hand, by the way. He's got a gun in the other hand. He's like, I will kill you unless you take off my He hand. does say that. He says, yes, he I've got his line written down. He says, either you cut my hand off or I'll kill you, is what he says. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, also, I forgot. I, I haven't been looking at my notes, but oh, I, I thought it would be really funny if the hand got into a boxing glove and just kind of like boxed the <laughs> Stuart Whitman around. <laughs> um, the music at some point, I don't know if you caught this or not, but the Dude. fucking music goes, how can I even do it in notes? Like it basically says nanny, nanny, boo, boo in, in music. Did you hear that? <laughs> I caught the waka chihuahua music oh, yeah, during no. the car chase. <laughs> there is a, um, wah, wah pedal, but it, it goes, yes. bum, 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 bum. I can't think. I mean, it's yes. exactly oh. during the hand creeping up on stuff. The music is bonkers. When it is crawling on the se- the front seat of the cruiser, when it jumps up into his face, it makes a flapping noise like <laughs> like it has like it's using its thumb and pinky as like wings or something. It flaps at him like a bird. Anyway, I don't know why they added that. And then below all of this, it just says worst movie we've ever done question mark. So <laughs> that's before I knew how good it could get. This I get you just gotta watch this, and appreciate these. Scenes. This whole scene is wild. So he cuts off the cop's hand slowly, and so the next scene we just see the cop standing there presenting it on a tray. <laughs> yes, seeming to be kind of cool, calm, and collected. Like, oh, that's done. Yeah, like he pulled a tooth or something. The hand jumps off onto the table. The nurse screams and run away while the hand grabs a gun. <laughs> <laughs> when you say it out loud like that, it sounds insane. But yes, that's what happens. It is insane. It is insane. It doesn't have any eyes. How does it know where to point? Man, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but I loved it. It shot the nurse as she's running out. Yeah. No and rules. And then jumps up and starts attacking the police officer. Everybody's acting when they are being manhandled. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I heard it. I was just going to let it go on by. It's so funny. Yeah. And it loves to just grab the face and squish. Yes. Yeah. I, I, That's its like finishing move is like. go to. And somehow it like broke the cop's neck. Yeah. Again, it has no leverage on anything, but yeah, it managed <laughs> to like snap his neck. The cop is the best actor in the entire movie. It looks like he should be, like, removing a wart or something. He's just taking the whole damn hand. The police officer goes down. The hands, the demon hand's attacking him. The the doctor goes after to help him and then immediately gets the hand onto his hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Samantha Eggert runs away, and he, this acting is... Oh, my God. When he is trying to catch her, <laughs> he's, like, boggling her, and... This dude is someone that they just thought looked like a doctor because he is definitely not an actor. I think he has one line. He's like, you know, this is going to hurt, right? Yes. <laughs> and he's got a syringe and he yes. jabs it into her stomach, into her back, into her, throat. Into her neck. And when you get a close up in the neck, you know, it's, it's <laughs> yes. it looks like a toy. Yes. It looks like a toy. And also it is a toy. It's, <laughs> ma- it's like a Fisher Price, like. You know, hospital. Yeah, that is hilarious. The gun fucking shoots that big titted nurse dead. This is not a doctor's office. Okay, I'm just to the scene where Stuart Whitman pulls up into the car and it says plastic surgery yep. center. He's like, you know what? Come work for me and I'll set you up. Okay. She slides the handcuffs off, which she could have done the entire time. There is a zap again 
like Tyler Durden's penis in Fight Club, <laughs> there is a demon for like a split second. Yeah, every time it takes over a new body, I think we see a flash. Just a flash. Yep. Oh my God, that scene is hilarious. But in the middle of all that, it cuts to Stuart Whitman like repairing stained glass. Yes. Did you see that? It only lasts for like a minute. Yes. I don't know why they cut back to him. That was just to set up that blowtorch. Right. And the glass. And, and the reason why there's a lot of stained glass. Yes. We couldn't believe that it was because it was a church. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You're looking at that glass and you're like, man, that shit's going to come in handy later. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's all I was going to say is that he's got like a kiln and all that stuff. Which I thought the kiln would come into play. That's that's what I was thinking, too, is like the stained glass would like, you know, project a like cross onto something or, you know. Ah, see, I was thinking that they would make a new hand coffin out well, of glass. Yeah, exactly. That little kiln. Well, see, that would have been a much better and more coherent plot. <laughs> um, it just wants to take a nap. It just wants to be back yeah. in its box. I think. But it destroys that box later yeah. because they're like, go get the hand coffin. And it's just like a crumpled up piece of tin. Yeah, that she picks it up later. And I was like, oh, well, that one that she's got looks like it's just made out of cardboard because it's like falling apart. That was a cool like uh, little container because it had kind of like that baphomet it had like a goat's head on it. Oh, all right. I know what else I was going to say. Right after, <laughs> right after this scene, just... Was the editor, like, on vacation, like, right in the middle of this? Because all that shit was edited together crazily. And then he takes her body back into the, the like, operating room. But then it cuts to Stuart Whitman. Snooping around her yeah, car. Yeah, snooping around her car. That was all set up just so he can find the hand coffin. Uh, okay. That's all that scene was for. Okay, somewhere in here he makes a phone call. This is all I was trying to say. I think he calls maybe uh, the hotel wherever she's staying, maybe. It is a 10 second long scene where he says, well, I guess it I guess it gives him the motivation of like driving around and trying to find her, but he's asking like the concierge or whoever the guy is at the front desk um mm -hmm. where she is. Part of the phone call is like a 80 yard in, you know, you, you're just yes. hearing the guy at the front desk. And then it cuts to that guy at the front desk for a whole scene. He's like, no, she she's not here. Then cuts back to Stuart Whitman and you hear his voice on the phone again. And it was just like, why did we need to see that guy that didn't clear anything up and made no sense? But anyway, I digress about the front desk guy. He also <laughs> kind of looked like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer a little bit. Stuart Whitman basically came to find her. Right. How did he know that she was... At this plastic surgery center. I don't know. Small town? So Stuart Whitman got another cop to take him around and try to find the original cop. This is where it turns into like a Starsky and Hutch episode where so many cars are flipping over. Oh, You yes. know, like riding up those like ramps and... The doctor's in Boss Hogg's car. <laughs> yes! Yes. It's only missing like the horns on the front of it or something. Yes. Oh my God. That's so true. So they all pile into the police car and the police officers chasing after. Yes. It's a Cadillac, too. I'm sorry. In several scenes, you don't see anybody in the back seat. No, no, no. Yeah. Of the car. Yeah, there's very obviously different people. But these fl the flipping of these cars, I think that was that was awesome. It was amazing stunt work. Oh, I mean, yeah, you don't <laughs> you don't see that in every single cop show from the 70s. <laughs> it literally is like that like man this episode's kind of dragging let's let's flip some let's cars. flip over a DeSoto or something you know whatever they were driving <laughs> back then the scene of the doctor getting out of the car and hanging yes. on the side is the craziest of a moving train <laughs> <laughs> it is so funny really now Especially when the uh, the fucking, you know, like happens in every Western ever made. He hits that like, you know, sometimes it's like a mail drop or something. But this time it's like mm -hmm. a, I don't even know what they do with that thing. I don't even know what to call it. It's like a, a water tower type thing, you know? Right. Okay. I don't know what it's dumping into that train. I don't know how trains work. 
when the police car, when he's chasing him, he hits this, uh, this lower down dock. Yeah, it's like a dock, yeah. When the cop car jumps that, yeah. you actually see people in the back seat yeah. of the car being flung around. Yes, there, it, lo- it basically looks like Animal playing the drums on the Muppets. Like you see a head, <laughs> you see like a bunch of hair flying back and forth. But this this is the slowest moving chase next to the train. It's like it's like the chase in Mitchell, but like slowed mm. down even slower. <laughs> <laughs> they merge successfully. Yeah. Why does he keep downshifting in an automatic? That's <laughs> the question. The car is definitely hooked to this train, <laughs> going the same exact speed when he climbs out onto the the freaking ladder of this train. Yes. So yes, the doctor's hanging onto the train and he's going towards the water tower thing in slow motion, like he said, and just screaming. But then. <laughs> Doesn't take any precautions. To no, move. he could have jumped off. He could have sucked up. I mean, he's in between cars. I mean, he doesn't look like he could move very fast, but he could have avoided that. But that's what I was trying to figure out because he's acting kind of insane too. And but I realize he's not being, you know, controlled by the hand. But when he <laughs> when he gets out of the car onto that ladder, he's like laughing, like he's triumphant, oh, yes. like he, he's like, I did oh, it, yes. I did it. Just hanging on by his left demon hand. Yeah. Probably because he never had the strength before in his left hand to hold on to something like that. He's probably just giddy. Look at me. I'm an action star. I, If they had clarified that at all or made it seem like that's what would happening, it would have been better. But he's not being controlled. He's just having a weird... He just... None of that crap made sense. That entire mm. scene didn't make sense. It was just so the doctor could fall down and, oh. and then stick his hand on the tracks to cut his hand off. Yes, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. He is being possessed by the hand. Yes. Okay. The hand gets chopped off and then grabs the okay. underside of one of the train cars. <laughs> the The hand hopped a train. Exactly. It's got a little <laughs> bindle and <laughs> a harmonica. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, this movie could have been a thousand times better than this if it had just been a comedy instead. Yes. Oh, my God. Stop trying to be serious. What if Dudley Moore was uh, instead of Stuart? (laughs) (laughs) That is a movie I would watch 1,000%. We're not putting this on the podcast. we got to write that script. (laughs) Edit that out. Edit all of that. So, basically, they, they just gave up. They just like, oh, well, you know, that's over with. Yeah. Until Stuart Whitman's driving home, he drops Samantha Eggert off. He's driving home and gets stop. He stops at a, a car accident, and in which a police officer says, "This guy is dying. Would you mind stopping and doing your last rites?" What? Yeah, I got nothing better to do. Yeah, I'm half drunk. He's <laughs> like, like, "What time is on it over there?" Yeah. Well. <laughs> And when he notices the guy that was in the car accident who's flung through the windshield is missing his left hand. So now Stuart Whitman knows that the demon has not hopped the train and gone out of town like he suspected. So in this town, there have been two major vehicular accidents within uh, within an hour of each other. Yes. And the hand was responsible for both of them. Yes. So now this has become like a transportation deal. They, you know, I mean, that's their jurisdiction. Um, I missed all of that. Have no idea that that happened. Mm -hmm. All I, all I did was cut to the hand in the courtyard of the church. And I guess there really is like a guy that is just in charge of like throwing that hand because I can't tell if it's being swung by a wire sometimes or. This is where I said, whee. It flew basically. It has the power of flight. Stuart Whitman sees the guy with the missing hand, goes back to Samantha Eggert, where he just dropped her off at a hotel. Yeah. In the meantime, she's pulled back her covers, getting ready for bed, and she sees the hand. Well, how many hands do we have in play? There's just one, right? (laughs) That's the same hand. Okay. Man, it is traveling. It knew what room she was going to be in at the hotel, I guess, or maybe she's already been there and that's been established. Uh Whatever. But it's hiding out, waiting for her. She jumps up to grab the the hand coffin. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's where she noticed it's been mangled. Okay. And she like throws it away. The hand is 
crawling slowly across the the shag carpet like three inch thick shag it's like (laughs) real 70s shag um in our version of this movie the hand would for sure be wearing like an apple watch and at some point it like looks (laughs) down (laughs) it either looks down and says it has zero steps because it doesn't have feet and it's like oh and then goes deuces yeah oh you could do so much so Stuart Whitman comes to get her she opens up the door to leave and just jumps right into his arms yes and they run out they see the hand there. They don't try to stop it or anything. They Put just run away. A trash can over it. Yeah. Yeah. I do this to spiders all the time. Exactly. Treat it like a spider. Just open the screen door and let it out. So they're running around this courtyard to get out of the out of the hotel, mm-hmm. but the hand starts crawling towards the window. It's a hand, guys. <laughs> it climbs out the window as they're driving away. And just jumps onto the car yeah. as they're driving away. Yep. And that's where I was like, wee! Yep. <laughs> it has the power to fling itself for short distances. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it didn't have that power, this would be a pretty boring movie because it has managed to travel like a hundred miles. So this is a scene that I had a problem with. I had to rewind. Okay. We go back to the church or wherever, the parish or whatever. I was wondering, he was behind the car locking the gate because when they start running in she gets out of the car and he joins her from behind right okay and i was like he wasn't in the car yeah who drove i was like oh okay he was he was closing the gate but then i was like well then who fucking pulled the car up (laughs) because she gets out of the passenger seat you shouldn't have these questions (laughs) there's not there's no like continuity director at all those two shots are probably like weeks apart I love it also that the hand has cut the power to the church. <laughs> like it's, it's yes. conniving. It shows a slow pan across the car as the hand comes around the bumper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Stuart Whitman goes to make a phone call and the phone line goes dead. Oh my God. So it's our, it's cut the phone. What if line. the hand picked up on the other line? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you. Oh, I was going with talk to the hand. Oh, that's that seems like we should have made that like at the very beginning. I'm glad that we've restrained <laughs> ourselves, you know, as much as much as we have. This is <laughs> this is complete restraint. I love it that the hand, I don't know, it kind of does a walk, you know, like a just that hand creeping walk is funny to me. I mean, this is years after the Adams family. Yeah, we've already seen this, but like a thousand times better in yes. black and white. Why can't you guys <laughs> figure it out? It just looks so fake. Yeah, Stuart Whitman is <laughs> not a good actor. I'm sorry. Uh, so they're they're running around the church. Yes. And I don't know what they're... Pro- they're they're uh, trying to get out? I, or are they trying to get... I don't know. The 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 hand has locked all the doors. So yes, they can't the hand like locked the door. That's what I got out of it. <laughs> it's like... And its ultimate goal is to get attached to Samantha Egger, right? Yes. I wish there was a reason for that or any type of thing that made sense. She does look good in those little suspenders, though. I'm very confused about this. Why? Because she's... Standing in the corridor and a sharp wind blows through yeah. that is moving the chandelier and it shows the altar and the sheet on the altar. <laughs> oh, yeah, the thing kind of levitates. <laughs> I have no idea where that was coming from. I, I did not get that at all. Uh-uh. <laughs> I love it that he goes in and is just randomly destroying uh, stained glass or whatever. She just pops up like behind the altar I guess he was flushing her out like a like a duck. Yes. I think that's why they showed the stained glass is just so he could destroy I it. I guess, but it would have been so much more satisfying if you don't actually see it broken. You you hear a noise of it break, but mm-hmm. nothing like crashes through it or anything. Probably because it's not stained glass. It's like clear plastic that they've just like markered on or Paint something. Paint by numbered. Yeah. Yeah. She's actually dressed like Michael Jackson in that um, Smooth Criminal video, I think. (laughs) Which is weird. 
This jump scare, though, when Stuart Whitman finds the hand of the mannequin priest or whatever. Yeah, he finds the mannequin hand. Yeah. And looks up to the mannequin. Yeah. As it jumps out. uh, That was funny. That just made me laugh. And again, the hand is a prankster. It likes like scaring people and stuff. That looks like something that you would see in, you know, like a Mel Brooks movie or something. But so much hand on face violence. I know. They really shouldn't do. They're going to get oil all over their faces. (laughs) That's bad for acne. Yeah. And every once in a while when it gets somebody, it looks like it's kind of giving them a face massage. You know, like they're just like, oh. She runs to help him as he's rolling around on the ground with this hand attached to his face. Mm -hmm. And then she does the exorcist bit of take me. It's me you want. Yeah, that was really silly. The hand crawls from his face. (laughs) It fell for it. Yep. And he jumps on it. He's got it in his death grip. And that's when it becomes part of him. So you see the flashes of the demonoid again. I love the people in this who have to pretend like they're fighting something, like in Phantasm, (laughs) when he has that bug thing. I mean, of course, he sells it more than anybody in uh, this movie. But what does she have? She has like some tool. It's like a a knife. Yeah, but it looks weird. It must be some tool for like making like stained glass or something. Just random stained glass tools. But he catches up with her and rams his hand through the stained glass. And this is where he thrashes all the stained glass, just with the left hand, just running through and just throwing every panel of stained glass down. It made me laugh so much. (laughs) He's such a bad actor. (laughs) But that is a chisel is what it is. Like a long, skinny chisel. Yeah. She finds it upstairs around his stained glass shit. Yeah. And I think you're meant to... Think that he is kind of fighting the hand, and that's the reason why it even gives her a chance to. He just punches through that stained glass and then looks at her like, Uh Uh This is it. Come and get it. You know, she goes towards it and just kind of puts her face into its palm. Yeah, and was vaguely like erotic for like five seconds. I didn't get that at all. And he says, This is where this is something weird, like this is where deliverance is or something. I don't know. That didn't make no sense either. I think they were just making it up day by day. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they knew that they've already gone off the rails. Yeah. Well, we know we have a hit here. Um, let's just stop doing anything that makes any type of sense. So he's like turning his hand into like like a Jamaican jerk chicken or something. <laughs> Looks delicious. So he stabs his hand through the right. wrist with that poker. He can't pull his hand out from the stained glass that he's been punched his hand through. Very convenient for everybody involved. So his hand is trapped on the other side of glass, so he's like, give me the torch. Mm -hmm. Give me the torch. Mm -hmm. And she's like, fireball? Yeah. He's like, yes, I want some fireball. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, it's like a very, I mean, it's not even really like a blow torch. It's just kind of like a a, flame. A flame. An eternal flame? (sighs) Maybe, yeah. This hand's burning in an eternal flame. See, I wanted to see if you'd hit that note, and you did. <laughs> it's close enough. <laughs> so anyway, that's basically, that's the end of the movie. Until she gets a bong delivered. <laughs> Dude. That also, this made no sense. I mean, I know I keep saying that. But then there's this scene that at least they could, I mean, you know what it's going to be, you know, if she, if the camera's still on her, something kooky is going to happen. I didn't get the water. What was the water all about? Are they spreading the ashes of the burnt hand into the lake? I don't know. I think that was a short scene before her and the priest were on the lake and it showed him doing something. I think he was pouring the ashes out. Yeah. She's walking around her apartment and she sees water on the floor that maybe that and the seaweed well, is yeah. because the hand reformed while it was in the water and then came out Leslie Nielsen style to. <sighs> and who okay. was with Ted dancing in that scene? Yeah. Yeah. Julie Haggerty? <laughs> no, no, it was. Uh, who was no. the girl? That wasn't Julie Haggerty. I really wanted a Julie Haggerty there. 
Julie Haggerty's voice is very simple to do. <laughs> you just have to whisper. <laughs> she doesn't quite have any breath in her body. I think that's my favorite imitation that you do. <laughs> is Anybody can do it. You just whisper a lot. No, it wasn't her. Ugh, and it was it uh was it Mrs. King from Scarecrow and Mrs. King? I can't mm, think of her name. I don't know. Ugh. Please call in uh and tell us who was on Creep Show. <laughs> if only we had <laughs> IMDB. So he dumped the ashes of the hand into the bay. The demon hand reforms from being in the bay and then has tracked her down to her house because just like the ad says, let your fingers do the walking. It Ugh. looked her up in the phone book. It yeah. knows where she lives. You're right. right. Mm-hmm. You're right. And so she sees the puddle of water. So and it, she sees two things of seaweed. Right. Because the delivery man shows up. Yeah. And pushes his hand and, through the thing. Yes. Uh, through the peephole in the door. Which nobody, uh, nobody does. So she opens up this box. So she's very hesitant because she sees more water. She should be. That's weird. She sees water in the foyer and some seaweed. And she picks up the seaweed like, eh, well, looks like I left my random seaweed. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. Nothing nothing strange here. No, nothing no to see. alarm going off. Until she opens up the box and she sees this big black and crystal bong. Right? Yes. <laughs> it's either like a dildo or a bong. It's a candle, which, has there been a candle in this movie at any point? Maybe in the first 30 seconds? She's wearing this uh, big, giant, like, cereal box (laughs) ring. This plastic ring. Yeah, it is weird. She also had, (laughs) I mean, that's a long time ago, but she had some gigantic glasses on. Like, you forget how big the glasses (laughs) were in the 70s. It, like, went up to her hairline. She pulls out the candle. Mm Mm-hmm. I assume all this just happened to her. And she's like, hmm. But the the faucet's dripping. And so she walks over to the sink and the hand is in the sink. (laughs) And it jumps up and grabs her by the hair. And this acting. I don't know. This (laughs) is is hilarious. I don't know what the director thought he was doing. I don't know what she thought she was doing. Uh -uh. I think they're both doing two completely different things. (laughs) She's got the fake hand on her, just like uh, Forbidden World. It's just attached to her. Yeah. It's like she has like a barrette that's like keeping it in her hair. And she spins around in circles until she, she got too dizzy. And she falls through the glass coffee table. Pretty cool scenes. I mean, it was very like, looked like an Italian, you know, murder movie. It flashes back to like a mummy. Like it compares her to it, yes. which that, that that doesn't help you out either. Her end scream looks like her as a mummy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it just like power bombs her head through the end table. I've watched this scene of her going through this glass like six times. I did too. I kind of like, you can slow it down too, just to see every mannequins look more lifelike than the head that they (laughs) threw through there. But yeah, I would have liked it if any of this stuff had been introduced earlier, like the candle or. Because I didn't realize until this watching of it, that they were dumping the hands, the ashes of the hand into the bay. Okay. Okay. Because there's a quick scene of just them on the boat. Yeah. And by the way, this priest has a boat, too. But Yes, um, of course. Okay. So we did it. I mean, the movie's over. Think about this. Jim Carrey in Stuart Whitman's (laughs) role. (laughs) Samantha Egger, uh, just any great, like, Kristen Wiig or something, okay? Okay. Um, Let's see. You basically take the same script, and you either have a comedy or a... I guess a horror movie. This is the hidden. They had yeah. to have seen this movie and said, you know what? I can write the hidden. Yeah. A body jumping movie. Make it just as funny. I do like that. You know what we should have done? Drank heavily when we watched this. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So we jumped through this movie actually pretty quick. I think we kind of went along with the movie. Once it gets some kind of momentum, it just gets crazier and crazier completely bonkers. The whole middle of this movie with the doctor and the car chase and the boobies. <laughs> for a minute I was like, whoa, hold on. I think I'm actually starting to like this movie now. I really enjoyed it. 
this is called demonoid. Show me a pentagram every once in a oh, while. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got a point. Throw a goat head in there. <laughs> there was a quick scene that shows yeah. some horns like something in her apartment. You're right. I am looking through the uh, the pictures. There's a uh, French box art that looks pretty oh, sure. damn cool. Yeah. The poster is amazing. All the art for this is amazing. It really sold it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it definitely got rentals in the 80s, you know. But this is like probably a real moratorium one. This came out pretty recently because it is put out by, um, I think, Vinegar Syndrome, which is kind of okay. like Arrow and Anchor Bay or anyway, it's one of those companies. It says in the description that that's a silver mine in Mexico. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so sure. Gives you something to hold on to. Watch this movie. That is what I'm left with at the end. Watch this movie mainly for a about 30 to 40 minute chunk right in the middle. And you're going to get some pretty cool stuff. I would say so. From the minute they walk into the doctor's office. Yes. <laughs> it gets insane. All right, man. That was a lot of fun. I'm so glad we did this film. Me too. Because I don't think I would have taken the time to watch this. I bet I watched the first 15 minutes. And even though there were boobies, I still was like, this is boring. <laughs> I just turned it off. But uh, it gets wild later. Alfredo Zacharias, you are a strange man. I don't know how long IMDb has been adding... The box office? I mean, maybe it always has, and I'm just now noticing it, but I got to get back to Demon Demonoid. I want to see if it, <laughs> it says, like, how much money it made. How much money did it lose? It says here, filming locations, Bronson Caves and Bronson Canyon, uh, Griffith Park, uh, oh. Los Angeles, California. Really? But were they ever in... Mexico. I think in my mind, I just assumed that they were simply for budget reasons. Yeah. It does not have any box office uh, numbers. I'm pretty sure this is probably straight to video. You know what would have been funny? It is the 70s. Well, it's 81. Ah, well. It should have had a mood ring on, you know? You're going to have to sign off this show with the the hand talking to us. You mean me? <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> Has a little mustache. Um, wow. I think we're still stunned that that happened to mm -hmm. us. I'm glad we saw that. Rest in power, Stuart Whitman. You were, well, you were in this movie. <laughs> so Samantha Egger, uh, she was in 1965, a movie called The Collector. Okay. Uh, a man kidnaps a woman. And holds her hostage just for the pleasure of having her there. <laughs> All right. Okay. It's starring Terrence Stamp. It is starring Terrence Stamp. This is young, young Terrence Stamp. He's mm -hmm. looking a lot like Norman Bates here. Hmm, interesting. She was also in a movie in 1963 called Dr. Crippen. <laughs> that sounds about right. It's the real life story of Dr. Holly Harvey Crippen, who was hanged in London in 1910 for poisoning his wife so he could be with his young lover, starring Donald Pleasance as Dr. Crippen. <laughs> oh, my God. That sounded very boring until you said that last thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. that's, that movie's probably insane. Dr. Crippen. He's got a, a big, like, Almost a handlebar mustache in it. Wow, interesting. Does he have a monocle, too? Uh, he should. Nobody's got little wire rim glasses. That was a missed opportunity. Is she Canadian? Uh, Samantha Eggert? Mm -hmm. No, she is uh, British. Okay. Well, yep, we know her from the brood. Her eyes are... Yes, her eyes were doing a lot in this film. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Mm, I love it. I think we did it. I think we did Whatever it. it was. I still had a lot more I wanted to talk about, and I have no idea what I wanted to talk about. I have some notes, too. Uh, on the yarn wall next week, we'll uh, kind of tie up some loose ends. Yeah, we'll forget about this movie by then. I'll never forget about this movie. <laughs> I'm going to watch it again right now. Right now. Hey, well, why don't you tell everybody where they can find us, Jason? Well, they can find us... Um, 
Our website is themoratorium.com, not dot org or dot net. Dot com. Um, and they can follow us on social media, moratorium, um, Twitter. Is there a Facebook page? Do I ask this every day? Yep. Sure there is. But you can also help support this podcast by joining our Patreon. Mm. All right. We want just small amounts. We want you to rain a few dollars on us. Measly. Throw us some quarters. Anything. We'll take anything at this point. Ski-ball tickets. Yes, I would love some ski-ball tickets. Monopoly money. But for as little as a dollar a month, you can help us out here at the podcast. If you want to give us $3 a month, you will get some exclusive content from the director's cuts. Yes, I make an mm. extra long version of the podcast, which has a bunch more information that probably doesn't even pertain to the movie we're watching. Nope. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, I'm the one, I'm half of the one doing this and it's got a lot of pork. So I trim the fat and release it to you. But if you like some of the fat, come on in for the director's cuts. I like the fat. You like fat? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. It's a prime cut. Is what mm, we're yeah. Prime me, director's cut. You're making me hungry now. And also, hey, go on over to uh, Teespring. Uh, I'm working on some new designs right now just because I want a zipper hoodie. Yes, I do too. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you can support us so we can keep coming around to spit insults into your ear every week. Yep. Our voices are crashing through the stained glass of your eardrums right now like we were disembodied hands. (laughs) That's very good. Way to tie it all together. I took the long way around. Let's uh let's close this bitch out the okay. way we always do. By talking to Handy. Hey, <laughs> you guys done watching that movie yet? Yes, we are Handy. Thanks, Handy. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> All right, bye bye then. Bye. Well, that was a load of freaking fun. It's going to take some digging to one-up this flick. Tune in next week when Jason and I mop up this mess and take you down the long, winding path to possibly the grossest film in history. Check out our website at themoratorium.com for movie links, merch, blogs, and more. If you have any movie suggestions or just want to tell us how much we really suck, you can contact us at moviemoratorium at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and long live VHS. I think I saw boobies. I know I saw boobies.